Awesome. So I'll share screen. And here's my presentation. So again, my uh, presentation will be on um, breeding and nesting biology in birds. Um, so really some, I'm gonna start out with breeding biology. Um, that will be the smaller part of the talk. And then afterwards we'll go towards nesting biology, which is going to be uh, re relatively speaking the larger portion. Um, but just some critical points about um, breeding biology. Um, some critical points are how do birds choose where and when to reproduce? Super important question um, to answer basically about any natural behavior, including this one. And a more specific question we ask is how do birds select mates? Uh, as we know, um, you need one male, one female bird to produce uh, offspring. How do, they, how do they choose? How does a male choose a female? How does a female choose a male? Um, okay, so birds reproduce um, when and where they're able to find resources to successfully raise offspring. And that depends based on the species, based on location, based on the season. For typically, we think of birds reproducing during the spring and summer. That's not always the case. Many of our more um, adaptable birds, for instance, doves, finches, and some sparrows, might nest all year long if they have the resources available to do so. Um, some birds in the tropics might nest, uh, have different nesting schedules because of different climatic patterns as well. But generally speaking, in North America, we have this sort of um, uh, breeding during the, 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 when insects are out, when um, vegetation is, is covered, etc. cetera. Um, for some birds, they might only nest once per year. That's typically, what, again, that's typically what we think about. Many birds um, will nest multiple times per year if they're given the opportunity. For instance, the dark-eyed juncos that I study will nest somewhere between two and four times per year. Um, and some birds, especially our larger birds that take a long time to develop as young, might not even uh, nest every year. Some examples of these are um, albatrosses, for instance, condors, I believe, um, kakapos in New Zealand, those flightless parrots. Um, so it's not always every year. Who nests? Um, pretty much, we, it's birds that reach sexual maturity, that have developed, um, have their primary and secondary sexual characteristics. Depending on the species, it's, for most passerines, for most songbirds, for instance, it's after it begins the second year. Um, but for some birds, such as um, gulls and raptors, it might be two years later, three years later, or even four years later. Um, I think for albatrosses, it might not occur until eight years after. Um, this being said, just because individuals are not reproductively mature doesn't mean that they aren't involved in breeding. Um, they can, for instance, um, help their parents. For instance, parents might produce one nest, um, uh, fledge their young, and then those youngs hang around to, help to um, raise the next nest. Um, and that's beneficial for the parents because it provides extra hand, extra mouth, um, extra um, mouths that can feed young, right? Um, but also it benefits the young because both they help raise their siblings, but also they get experience um, on how to raise them. Um, so that in the future, when they go off and form their own, um, uh, call, uh, their own pair, they can uh, be more successful. Um, a great example of this is um, acorn woodpeckers. Acorn woodpeckers are species that will form family groups um, uh, where you have a sort of a, a, a dominant pair, but then their offspring and relatives will help take care for several years afterwards. Um, some birds may forego nesting entirely if conditions are poor. This is often the case with many of our seabirds, for instance, terns and some others. Um, for seabirds, um, things like fish are often undergo boom and bust years. So 
for instance, uh, the last few years we've been in a bust on the West Coast for um, things like anchovies and sardines. Um, and so many of our local tern species are not returning to breed uh, in as large numbers as we would have expected. We think they're still alive, but they're probably just holding off on breeding until we get a better year, hopefully. Um, breeding is risky and expensive. Uh, it exposes individuals to predators. Uh, um, uh, something like a bird sitting on a nest is super um, vulnerable to a predator, like a cat or a snake or something like that, and has a high chance of getting um, predated. Um, it consumes time and resources. Um, you need to find a mate, you need to build a nest, you need to incubate, and you need to feed young. Um, and all those things are, do, are taking away from your ability to take care of yourself, to feed yourself, and so forth. Um, so basically, individuals make decisions to maximize their chance of producing offspring um, while also minimizing their personal risk because they both want to produce young, but they also want to keep themselves alive so that they can produce young in the future. Um, so like I as said, um, this is super important for things like passerines don't have shown here, it's a great horned owl. But passerines like songbirds suffer high annual mortality. For many migratory species, this approach is 50%. Um, so only one out of every two individuals will survive to the next year. So it's important to get reproduction done right because it might be your last chance. Um, so one of those important things is uh, mate choice. You want to make sure you pick an appropriate mate that goes into it. You want to have someone who's fit, who will transfer good genes to your offspring. You want to make sure that, you might want to make sure that they take care of your offspring. You might want help with parental care. Um, and you might want, um, um, you might want someone who, uh, a dominant individual who might help you um, take care of, like defend a territory. Um, so individuals, because reproduction is so important, individuals will go to great lengths to show that they are the one. And we're gonna talk about some of those lengths that they go to. Um, and because it's so important, um, these traits um, are subject to sexual selection. Those individuals that do, do a better job getting mates will tend to um, pass on those, those sexual traits on to the next generation. Um, one thing we think about when it comes to mate choice is sexual dimorphism, which is basically the idea that males and females aren't always alike, even though they're of the same species. So you can see this in this left-hand picture, in these left two pictures. These left two are both um, red-winged blackbirds. The one on the left is a male red-winged blackbird displaying, and the one on the right is a female blackbird. You can see that the male is much more brightly colored, whereas the female is much more drab and camouflaged. Generally speaking, Males are under stronger pressure. And the reason for um, evolutionary biologists disagree on the reasons for this, but it tends to come down to the idea that males can produce more sperm than females who can produce eggs. Um, so basically males can pr uh, fertilize, can pr sire more offspring than females. Females have fewer chances basically to mate because they have a limited number of eggs. And so they are under stronger pressure to select a dominant mate. Whereas a male can basically, even if a male mates with an unfit female, he still has enough sperm to um, sort of mate with many others. A female doesn't necessarily have that opportunity. Related to this is that females tend to, towards greater parental care. It's not always the case, but females tend to do more um, nesting duties such as incubation, feeding, nest building. Um, so um, again, they're, they have, they're under stronger pressure to make the right mate choice than males are. Now there are exceptions to this um, in birds. One example is um, phalaropes and spotted sandpipers. In phalaropes and spotted sandpipers, these are shorebirds. Um, the female actually will mate with a series of, mate, of males. Um, she will, the male will build a nest, mate with the female, she will lay her eggs and then she will move on to her next, to the next male. 
and the males will do all of the um, brood rearing. It's a kind of an odd, uh, it's kind of an odd uh, situation, but it's interesting because um, in foul ropes and spotted sandpipers, those are among the few species where females actually are more brightly colored than males. And this is a situation where females actually have to uh, attract males rather than it being the other way around. So some examples of sexual dimorphism include plumage. Um, plumage is super important. Um, bright colors in indicate many things. For instance, they indicate um, access to nutrients. If you, are, uh, if you are sort of just making it by and you're just trying to keep yourself alive, you aren't going to be investing a lot of time and energy into developing these bright colors that you see, for instance, on this manager. Um, so if you do have these bright colors, it means that you have a lot of, you're eating a lot of fruits, you're eating a lot of insects that are getting you a lot of calories, are getting you a lot of um, uh, pigments like carotenoids, and that shows that you're, generally you're in good health. Um, bold pattern, another hypothesis is that bold patterns might indicate an ability to avoid predators. The idea is that by make, it's paradoxical, by making yourself um, sort of vulnerable to predators, but still being alive, it suggests that you are able to, for instance, outfly them, outwit them, and so forth. Um, so the fact that's sort of the idea behind the peacock, um, right? Where the peacock has this really insane tail that really doesn't make sense uh, from an evolutionary standpoint. Um, Darwin, for instance, said that the tail, the peacock's tail, is the thing he, one of the things he hates most about life because it made no sense. But it makes sense if you think that the most fit peacocks that have these long tails are still going to be able to avoid predators. While if you have a less fit male that tried to have that tail, it would get eaten. And this idea is called the handicap principle, that you are showing I can have this bright coloration and make myself vulnerable and still, because I'm awesome, I'm going to uh, still get away. I'm still gonna be alive. Um, ornaments are kind of similar to uh, plumage, but they tend to be structural uh, rather than, you know, color-based. Um, so some examples include on the right, we see the sage grouse. As you can see, it's got those ornaments, it's got that fancy tail, it's got those, um, you know, it's got those neck pouches that, you know, produce sounds. It's got that, you know, those, that um, rough around its head. Uh, so those are some classic ornaments in, uh, in birds. Uh, excessive, but pretty classic, for, especially for the um, game birds. On the left, we see a snowy egret. And of course, during the uh, breeding season, egrets and herons will develop these plumes, these fancy, um, these fancy uh, feathers, basically, to attract mates. And there's sort of, you know, there's similar logic going between plumage, like reasons for having plumage, you know, having fancy plumage and having fancy ornaments. They just sort of present differently. Um, other examples include vocal communication, for instance, bird song. And there's really two reasons to have um, for birds to sing. Probably actually three, I'd say. But the two main ones are you want to signal to other females hey, I'm available, I want to mate with you. And the other reason to sing is saying, you know, to all the other males, stay off my turf, this is my territory, if you come in here, I'll fight you. Those are basically the two messages that are sent by birdsong. Uh, so things like longer, um, more complex songs might signal things like intelligence or learning capability, which might be desirable traits um, for females. Also, you might see things like maybe a higher frequency might be um, beneficial or things like um, maybe a higher amplitude, uh, hitting certain notes. Those are all um, you know, things that females might look for in choosing a mate. Typically, it's males that sing, but not always. Um, in some species like cardinals, females will sing as well. And sometimes you will have um, females um, duetting. Uh, with males. Um, so basically the female will sing one phrase and the male will sing the next phrase and the female will sing the next phrase after that and so forth. Um, and the reasons for this, they're not 
scientists are not quite sure about that, but it probably has a lot to do with territory defense. Uh, and territory defense, uh, basically females want to make sure that other females are not in the territory, both because they don't want them to steal resources, but also because they don't want um, their male mating with other um, females. Um, some other examples of sexual dimorphism include visual displays. Um, similar concept to song again, but you are, um, you are basically trying to uh, express this with an image as opposed to uh, uh, a sound. Um, some examples include like boobies, as we can see with these blue footed boobies signaling to a mate uh, on the left. Um, sandpipers, like the buff breasted sandpiper, where you can see a, a male on the right is sort of advertising to a couple of females. Um, a lot of um, galliforms, again, game birds like quail will do this. Hummingbirds will often, male hummingbirds will often do these elaborate dives um, from high up to try and um, impress females. Um, so there's many different examples. Black, red winged blackbirds, for instance, will puff up their, their uh, shoulders to show off their red epaulets. So there's a lot of different, there's a very much a diversity of different types of visual displays. Um, another one, which we don't think about so much, is nest formation. Uh, and in this case, males might be trying to signal to females, hey, I am a great, I will take care of, you know, your offspring. I am presenting you with, uh, look at these wonderful nests um, that I built that look nice. I'm a great, I'm a great dad, mate with me. Um, so things like cactus wrens, which you can see a nest of a cactus wren right here in a cactus, uh, the males might build, you know, three, four, five different dummy nests, most of which will not actually be used. But if a female comes to the territory, he will sort of show her around saying, here, check out this nest, here, check out this nest, here, check out this nest. And basically what they're doing is they're home shopping. They're shopping for homes. The female shopping for one of the homes for, um, to, to lay eggs in. Um, some courtship behaviors are not dimorphic. Many species, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you know, don't have this sort of uh, difference in investment between males and females. Um, and so there's less of a pressure for one sex to, to impress the other. Um, and instead, you might see these elaborate mutual courtship rituals. So a classic example you see on the left are these Western grebes, which are doing what's called um, walking on water. You know, it's sort of the, the water dance. Um, and you can look up videos, they're pretty awesome, but they will basically run across the water. And their, their ability to do it in sync with each other will dictate whether or not they can, um, whether or not they can, um, whether or not they will mate. Another example on the right, we have these albatrosses um, that are on the ground. They only come to, on the ground to mate. And I think they only, visit um, land every other, like they only come to, they only mate every other year. And so they mate for life. Um, and so when they come back to land, you know, back to the giant albatross colony, they need to find their mate. And the way they find their mate is by, again, doing this, these courtship rituals. And by doing these courtship rituals, they can figure out who is the, who is the mate that I haven't seen in a year and a half. Um, you know, that makes sense. Um, that way, again, they, they, that strengthens the pair bond. So mating systems are just as diverse as the methods of courtship. Um, they're informed by different things like habitat, resource requirements to raise young, predation risk, and maximizing productivity. So some examples include monogamy. Um, one male mates with one female. This can be like over the course of one season or these bonds can last multiple years. Um, and as I talked about before, lifelong pairs may engage in a lot of vow renewals. Um, one big advantage is that both parents will care for the young. So there's more parent, you know, there's more parents to feed them. Uh, there's more protection against predators. Some disadvantage is that, you know, predation carries a stronger risk if you have um, you know, if you have both parents involved in raising young. 
because now you have two, two birds together as opposed to just one. Um, and also because individuals aren't mating more than, you know, with other individuals, um, generally each individual will produce less offspring. So it's basically this trade-off between, you know, you're producing less offspring, but you're, you're giving more care to them. And some examples of this, like I mentioned before, include um, uh, loon, um, albatrosses, loons are another great example, um, swans and geese, um, many raptors as well. A lot of our larger birds tend to engage in, in monogamy. Now, of course, there's this thing called social monogamy, which is that uh, males and females will form pair bonds and raise their offspring, but they will um, mate with other individuals on the side. And we call those extra pair copulations. Um, and the level of extra pair copulations, um, it differs between species. Uh, these are fairy wrens at the bottom here. They're from Australia. And these are very socially monogamous, um, but basically the males and the females, you know, they will take care of their nests. Uh, the males aren't moving around between different nests. There aren't, um, you know, the, they're taking care of all the eggs that are in that nest. But pretty much 95% of nests of, of fairy wrens have um, nestlings that aren't genetically related to the dad. Um, okay, so what's, why do this? So there are advantages for males, obviously. Um, if, you if you have to sire, you know, if you get to sire, um, sire a, uh, offspring in multiple nests without having to care for them, that takes energy off you while still producing uh, young. And it also means that you get to um, produce, you know, it means that you get to, um, It means that you get to have not all your eggs in one basket, so that if the main nest gets predated, for instance, you still have a, 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 another offspring in another nest. Okay, what's the advantage for females, though? Um, the advantage for females is that it can increase the genetic diversity of a clutch. So let's say that you mate with a male, and it turns out he's not actually that fit. Maybe he has a recessive gene or something. Well, um, have it, you know, if you have nest for multiple males in your clutch, you get to uh, hedge your bets there. Now, some disadvantages of this is that maybe there's reduced parental care if there's less investment. Um, but again, in a lot of species that we thought were like basically monogamous, we're finding out actually do engage in this extra pair copulation on the side. I personally, like for my junker research, I've personally witnessed a lot of uh, males mating with females that were not their mates. Polygyny. Um, polygyny now is um, when one male mates with multiple females, and generally speaking, the females will raise the clutch, will raise the, the eggs. Some examples of this include blackbirds, hummingbirds, and ducks. Um, males of some species assemble harems. Basically, the male stakes out a large territory and will mate with all females on the territory, and the females will sort of raise the young. Uh, in other cases, um, the males will maintain territories independent of females, um, females sort of come by, you know, check the male out, maybe mate with him, and then go back to her own territory to, 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 to raise, raise the young. So some advantages um, to this is that, you know, dominant males can mate many times, right? Um, if you are a fit male, you maybe don't want to be chained up to just one female, one nest, etc. And also, you know, if, you're, if, the female, if the best male is mated with all the females, then the females don't need to necessarily compete for the best male. Now, some disadvantages is that, you know, for males to show that they are, you know, the one, the dominant one, they need to heavily invest in um, breeding plumage uh, and behavior. So again, these species tend to be the ones that have these really elaborate courtship rituals, that have these really elab uh, elaborate um, plumages and ornaments and stuff. Um, and if they don't have them, then otherwise they can get shut out and not made at all. Um, and females generally speaking have to raise their young on their own. So they lose that extra wing to help out with that. Polyandry is again, similar, but it's where one female mates with multiple males. Um, again, short, some shorebirds like spotted sandpipers and phalaropes will do this. Um, and in these cases, the males are generally the main offspring raisers. 
Um, another example is polygenandry, and this is, um, there's sort of these two, the concepts sort of bleed into each other, but basically both males and females will take multiple partners. A classic example of this is the salt marsh sp sparrow. Those of you in the east will be, might be familiar, on the eastern seaboard will be familiar with this species as living only in the, you know, the salt marshes of like estuaries and stuff. And um, if you think about where they live, they live in areas that are seasonally flooded. Uh, and so at any given time, you know, half the territory might be underwater. And so in this species, males don't really keep territories. Uh, males sort of tend to just roam around looking for females to mate with. Males are roaming, uh, females are roaming around looking for males to mate with. Um, and, you know, if they find each other and they like each other, they'll mate, then the female will go off, raise her own um, nest as fast as possible before the tide comes in, you know, before like hot, the high tide of the month comes in. So in like situations where thing, where territories are highly unpredictable like that, you know, polygenandry, where you're not even bothering to maintain a territory might be beneficial. Lex are an interesting example of sort of both poly, polygeny and polygenandry. Um, and this is where, you know, males aren't necessarily maintaining a territory. Instead, they're going to the specific location. Basically, all the males in an area will go to a specific location. It might be like a hill. It might be like a, uh, you know, by like a pool, uh, like a pool of water or something. They all come together and they all sort of um, advertise themselves. The females come in and the males do their absolute best to, you know, show, compared to all the other males, that I'm the one. So sage grass are a great example of this, um, where they will do their, um, their uh, chest pumping or um, prairie chickens with their, um, with their um, booming, for instance. Uh, buff breasted sandpipers are another great example. In the tropics, there's some songbirds that do this. But there's some advantages to this. Um, for females, you know, um, it's easy to have all the males sort of on display at once. That way you don't have to visit one male decide, mm, should I mate with them? And then go visit another male, mm, should I mate with them? So instead, if you have everybody in one place, you, you get to choose who's, 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 who's the best one. And for males, there's less of a need to maintain a territory if everybody's sort of all together. Um, so again, you can look up many of these places, you know, are many of these lecking grounds are places where um, these species will have congregated for like centuries or have no, been known to congregate for centuries. Um, and this is sort of culture, culturally passed on between generations. Okay, so that's what I have about breeding biology. Now we'll go to what I know more about, which is nesting biology. And some main questions I'll ask here are, where do birds nest? Where, where do birds nest? How do nestlings develop as they age? And what threats do nestlings and their parents face? So there's a dizzying variety of nesting strategies. There's, you know, there's, uh, I'm mostly gonna focus on the eight to 10 that are found most commonly in North America, but you go elsewhere, you'll find other, others as well. They basically can nest anywhere except underwater and in the air. Uh, before I get to that, I'll just make a quick note about solitary versus colonial nesting. Uh, birds may nest by themselves, like most, most songbirds tend to nest by themselves, but they can also nest in large groups, up to say many individuals, like you know, sooty terns, uh, many um, alcids like murres and ox and stuff, penguins as well. Um, and there are advantages to colonial nesting. Um, one is that uh, for anyone who's ever walked by a turn nesting colony before, they there is defense in large numbers. They can, they're really effective at mobbing potential predators, um, you know, driving them away. It's hard to raid nests if you've got, you know, thousands of angry birds at your tail. Um, there's less of a need to defend territory. You know, you have to defend like maybe a little bit, a little square five feet wide, as opposed to j protecting like a five, you know, a two acre territory. So there's less energy that goes into that. Um, you can maximize use of space. So if you're a species that has specific nesting requirements, um, like you only nest on offshore islands, you know, by packing it in uh, together, you can um, do really uh, well. 
you know, you can get to, you can get much larger groups of individuals than you would if they were maintaining territories. It can also facilitate cooperation um, between individuals, both for like uh, territory defense, um, but also um, predator defense as mentioned above. At the same time, there's also disadvantages to colonial nesting. Um, populations can be wiped out by a single predator or weather event. Many of our island populations, our island seabird populations are really in decline because of things like introduced house cats, rats, um, other mammals that you know, they haven't adapted to. Another example is you know, if a hurricane comes in, it can really wreak havoc on a, on a colonial, on a colonial um, nesting ground. Because individuals tend to be in close quarters, it might also spread disease. And because you're not maintaining a territory, you have to travel to gain resources. You might have to travel many miles uh, from one place to another uh, to, to gain resources, whether it's out to sea or out to a lake or something like that. Out to a field, for instance. Okay, so now we're gonna start talking about nest examples. Um, the first, the most basic, I, I like to call it the scrape and ground. Um, it's practiced by many shorebirds um, and seabirds, as well as night jars and some other species. And there's some advantages to this. Uh, one example, one advantage is that, you know, it doesn't take any effort to build a nest. Um, also, if you are, excuse me, if you are um, in an area where there's not really any place better to nest, you know, if you're on a beach, for instance, or you're in a like a bare field, maybe that's all you can do. Maybe that's all that's available. Um, of course, there are disadvantages. If you are on, if you're nesting like just in a scrape on the ground, it's very easy for predators to um, monitor you and maybe find you and, and eat your nestlings uh, or eggs. Also, they potentially can get trampled. Um, so adults may adopt unusual anti-predator defenses. Um, for instance. Um, Kildare's, uh, the Kildare's broken wing dance, um, you know, where they feign a broken wing to sort of lure predators away from where their egg or nestling might be. Another example, of course, is things like turns mobbing um, potential predators. Um, one thing you see in many nests like these is that the, the nests, the eggs and the nestlings tend to um, uh, blend in really well. So you can see on the right, you can see a snowy plover a uh, nest with a pair of eggs, and those eggs are pretty well blended in. You, the camera's super zoomed in so you can see it, but if it were, you know, if it were several meters away, those net eggs would be very difficult to see. Same thing goes with this night jar uh, in the middle with its two nestlings as well. Those, those can camouflage very well into the gravel. Now, um, the next level up, you might say, is our nest built on, on the ground, but you actually have a nest instead of just like your eggs directly on the ground. This is more common than people might think. Um, there are many, many ground nesting songbirds, for instance, many um, sparrows, larks, pipits, meadow larks, bobolinks, bobble I believe, um, also things like quail. Um, again, they're common in grassland species uh, because in grasslands you can see, um, you know, there's not really shrubs or trees to nest in. Again, so you have to, you're limited to nesting on the ground. These nests may often be woven out of grass fibers, but might also include other um, materials. Some advantages include, um, you know, there's no shortage of nesting sites, and they can, you know, they can be surprisingly um, hidden. Speaking from personal experience, monitoring a ground nesting songbird, they can be surprisingly difficult to find. Disadvantages is that they are pretty accessible and so they do have high predation rates. Many prairie species can have predation rates up to 90%. Um, and they're, in addition, they can be easily trampled by things like large grazers. In the, uh, you know, in the prairies, you might have to worry about bison or um, deer or stuff like that. In, you know, in areas where people live, you might have to worry about people as well. Um, other examples include cup nests. Uh, those may be placed in trees or, uh, or bushes. Um, they're often built with materials such as pine needles, grass, hair, snake skin, spider webs, fur, um, 
a co uh, like you know the cotton coming off of willows and cottonwoods. Um, I would say it's the it's the most common strategy for songbirds. It's the one we're most familiar with. You know, it's a, an advantage is that it can be built anywhere where there are trees or shrubs, and they can provide protection against ground predators. A big disadvantage for them is that a lot of arboreal predators, like many birds, um, might wreak havoc on on cup nests. Um, and so in many species that are particularly susceptible to, um, to these like, bir uh, to these um, bird avian predators like scrub jays, corvids, raptors, they may actually move towards nesting on the ground. Um, yeah. The next one is kind of similar, platform nests. They tend to be wider and larger than cup nests and they don't tend to be woven together or so much as stuck together. They tend to be made out of these really big branches uh, to hold up, you know, large, heavy eggs. They tend to be made near the tops of trees. Many raptors, waders, some large like crows and uh, ravens will also build platform nests. An advantage for them is that they tend to be pretty, you know, they tend to be pretty reusable. Um, and, you know, if you're a, you know, if you're a heron or if you're a, a raptor, you're probably not worried too much about nest predation. You're the one predating others. You're not, you're not getting predated so much. Um, so you don't necessarily have to worry about um, concealing it. These nests tend to be pretty um, conspicuous. A disadvantage to it is that it might take a super long time to build because they're, they tend to be much larger than anything else. Uh, another example uh, are pendulum nests. Instead of sort of like cup nests being placed sort of like a hook of a, of a, of a a tree branch or something, or in a bundle of leaves, these tend to hang down from branches or from palm fronds. Um, some examples of these include um, orioles and bush tits. Um, some advantages of these is that it's safer from predation because they're hanging down and often they have these complicated entryways. Um, it's harder for predators to access, like um, things like snakes or birds, it's gonna be tough for them to get in. Some disadvantages is that it takes more time and resource, they're resource intensive to build because you have to weave them together super tightly so that they don't fall apart. Um, a, uh, I'll just point out the bush shit nests on the left. These can get, these nests can get super elaborate. The bush shit is North America's smallest songbird. It's about four inches. I had a bush shit nest in my yard this year that was probably over a foot tall. So these things can get super large and elaborate and take a lot of time to build. Um, another example, um, things like uh, tree cavities. Um, these may be primary cavity nesters. So basically like woodpeckers, it's mostly woodpeckers that build their own, that drill their own hole into wood uh, or maybe enlarge an existing hole. Um, or they may be secondary cavity nesters. Things like parrots, like um, chickadees, mice, um, nuthatches, some tree swallows, um, some wrens that use holes that are already there, whether they're natural cavities caused by decay of the tree or if they're formed by woodpeckers. Um, some advantages to them is that they're very safe compared to nests and trees. It's really hard for things like birds to get access to them um, or mammals to get access because they tend to have these relatively small entryways and the nest tends to be pretty deep in. Um, and also they, because they're sort of insulated by the tree itself, they can provide some temperature moderation. Some disadvantages that these cavities often tend to be in short supply, because again, they either have to form naturally or woodpeckers have to make them, so they're kind of constrained by it, like woodpecker density. And so there can be really fierce competition for these. For many species, many species are, su are super dominant, like house wrens will destroy other birds' nests uh, in cavities and use them. Um, blue uh, bluebirds, for instance, might get uh, evicted by things like house sparrows or starlings, which are invasive, uh, and might even be killed by them when they try and commandeer a nest. So um, there tends to be really sharp uh, competition. One thing that tends to reduce competition is the use of uh, artificial nest boxes, which mimic the cavity sort of um, appearance for birds. And so you'll often, if you go to the local parks, you'll see your local bluebird boxes or swallow boxes and things like that. 
Uh, now we get to the more eccentric nests. Um, some examples include mud, sal mud or saliva nests, things like swifts or swallows. They'll take things like, uh, you know, swallows will take, many swallows like barn swallows or cliff swallows will take mud uh, and then attach it to like overhanging structures, whether it's a cave or a cliff or a freeway overpass, and then stick it, you know, stick it on. It dry, you know, overall it dries, it hardens. And then, um, uh, and then they can nest in it. And those are super difficult. Like if you, it's almost impossible to imagine a predator accessing either of these nests. Um, another example is uh, swifts. Many swifts will actually build nests using their own saliva. They'll basically bring in things like twigs and things and they'll glue them together with their own saliva. If, if you look up uh, bird's nest soup, it's actually uh, built, it's actually produced from the nest of a bird called the edible nest swiftlet, which uses its own saliva to build, um, uh, to build nests. Uh, some nest example, uh, other nest examples include floating nests. Things like loons and greaves might build their nests on the water because they're really unable to function on land. So they'll, they'll, they'll actually build on the water. They'll generally might, like, make a plat floating platform and just leave it there, maybe next to an island so it doesn't like sink too deep. Um, uh, otherwise, you get uh, next up, you get outcrops. They can be placed on cliffs and large rock formations. Um, many raptors and colonial seabirds will do this. So like you can see this common myrrh here, you can barely see its baby, baby nestling uh, myrrh huddled in there right next to like a 20 foot drop. Super safe from predators. But again, a disadvantage is that there might be few potential nesting sites. And again, if you are a nestling and you fall from there, you're probably dying. Or if you're an egg and you fall from there, you're breaking. Um, kind of related to this uh, are artificial nests. Many of our birds that nest on outcrops have adapted to nest on buildings. So on the left here, you see the famous pale male who nests on a large building, a large skyscraper in um, Manhattan, right next to Central Park. Um, so things like eaves, window boxes, chimneys might be used, chimney swift. Um, you can see on the right, you can see, a, this is a photo of mine, a junco made a nest under a, a, a cardboard box, actually. Uh, I've had and security helmets, uh, all sorts of places, uh, crazy places, um, on top of, top of fuse boxes. So some advantages is that, you know, if you are able to do this, you can live well in an urbanized area. And oftentimes these offer greater protection, um, which is one of the findings actually I found from my research. Um, some disadvantages is that, you know, in urban areas in our, with these artificial nest sites, there tends to be high human disturbance. And individuals need to recognize these sites as potential nesting sites. It doesn't matter how many potential sites um, uh, are available if you're hardwired to ignore them. Uh, and then you have uh, other birds' nests, you know, known as brood parasitism. So the classic example in North America are cowbirds, um, which are obligate brood parasites. So they only build nests in um, other birds. Uh, they only lay eggs in other birds' nests. You can see here, it built a, uh, it's laid an egg in what looks like a robin's nest. Um, and so cowbirds are pretty much the only ones in North America that, are ha that only do this. Um, but some species like ducks will often dump eggs in other nests. For instance, like mallards, you know, might lay 10 eggs in their nest, but then lay like another five eggs in, in the nest of their neighbors. Um, and that's known as egg dumping. So some advantages, you can lay more eggs. If you're a cowbird, you can maybe lay up to 40 eggs in a season, as you don't need to provide for them. Other birds will provide for them. Um, because uh, you don't have to take care, uh, because you don't have to take care of them, you're putting yourself at lower creation risk. Some disadvantages is that, you know, there is this evolutionary arms race between the parasites and the hosts. And so many hosts adopt anti-predator defenses, like counting their eggs, abandoning nests where they recognize that there's been parasitism, um, tossing eggs that don't look right, et cetera. So there are evolutionary feedback. Uh, there is evolutionary, evolution at play here. 
Um, and one thing to note is that different, you know, the same species can use different types of nesting location. So here we see on the left, we see up way up in, you know, probably the Siberian tundra or something, or the Scandinavian tundra, we see a peregrine falcon nesting on the ground, feeding its nestlings. Whereas on, our, on the right, we see a peregrine falcon feeding nestlings in the middle of a city on what looks like a ledge or a window box. So again, many birds are super flexible in terms of where they nest. So to talk a little bit about the nest building process. Uh, it may take place during or after courtship. It can be done by the male, the female, or both, depending on the species. Um, and depending on nest complexity, it can take a few hours. It's a scrape in the ground, it can take a few minutes to a few weeks. And sometimes you may see nests reused, especially those larger platform nests or the cavity nests or um, the harder to build ones, like the, or also like the swallow will often be reused. They'll be uh, renovated, but they will also be reused. So eggs, those are generally laid a few days after copulation. They're usually laid on different days because it's a resource intensive process. And again, it depends on the species, but it's generally delayed until most eggs are laid. And the reason for that is you want all the nestlings to sort of be um, developing at the same rate. Eggs may vary in color or patterning, but in more vulnerable locations, they'll often camouflage, like we talked about with the plovers that are nesting on the ground, uh, or many of the ground nests as well. Uh, individuals may lay between 1 and 15 eggs. If you're a cow, you may lay up to 40. Um, and individuals, you know, that may vary. Individuals aren't necessarily hardwired. They may lay fewer eggs during resource poor year. So if, if it's a junco and we have a great year, like we did last year, you might see, like actually this year, we had a great year. Uh, we had a lot of nests with like five or even six eggs, whereas the year before, it seemed a lot more three to four egg nests. All right, incubation. Once eggs are laid, the parents, usually the female, will incubate them. Uh, and that's to keep eggs at appropriate temperature for development so that they don't overheat or freeze because that will render them inviolable. Um, the incubating parent will, may develop a brood patch. And that's basically a vascularized, um, they lose their feathers on their belly and that skin gets vascu vascularized. There's basically a lot of blood vessels fill up there. And that's basically to facilitate heat transfer between the parent and the eggs. So you can see sort of what that looks like on the, on the left here with this EE. Um, incubating parent, the incubating parent will leave the nest for short periods of time to forage. So um, for instance, uh, with my, Juncos, we'd, I'd see a, a, in juncos only the female um, incubates and I'd see females incubate for like half an hour to 40 minutes before um, leaving to forage for five minutes. So you can imagine when they do forage for themselves, they have to feed themselves fast enough within five minutes to go and then go back and sit for another 40 minutes. So when you see birds incubating, they'll often be and they're not foraging, they'll be super rushed and stuff, which is one way we identify when birds are nesting. Other species, you might see the male, you know, might see the male feed the female um, when she's in creating the nest so she can spend more time at the nest. And this lasts until eggs hatch, or maybe even a few days afterwards, anywhere from two to six weeks. Hatchlings, they may be, there's a range, um, but it goes from precocial to uh, altricial. Altricial birds, um, they're born with their feathers, uh, down feathers, and their eyes open. And generally speaking, they can move in hours after nesting. And the reason for that is that, um, you know, uh, basically so they can get out from an unsafe area and go out foraging with mom. So some examples include waterfowl, shorebirds, galliforms, things like that where within a few hours, they're already out running around learning to eat, following mom. Um, the next step is precocial, which is um, similar to precocial, um, but it's sort of in between because um, they're not able to move far from nests, from the nest. Um, their eyes are open and they're born with feathers and they can maybe waddle around a little bit, but they're still sort of reliant on being fed by mom and dad. So some examples of this are gulls and turns where they might move like a foot or two or a few inches, but they're pretty much still relying. 
Um, yeah. Um, next up, I'll go to the bottom here is semi altricial nests. Those are similar to altricial um, nests. They're sort of in between again. Um, they're born generally with their eyes open, but they're generally naked with maybe a few down feathers. So they're totally reliant on mom and dad. They can't move at all and they're stuck to their nest. But they are able to like open their eyes and, you know, actively beg. And that's things like raptors. And finally, we see altricial. And those are, you know, those are your pastures, your songbirds. Those are born naked and helpless. They look like little jelly beans. Born. Their eyes are closed. Um, and they must be fed um, by parents in nests. Um, they're totally helpless. If you take them away for too long, they, they die because they're, they are totally reliant on their parents for food, for everything. They also are not able to thermoregulate so that um, until they're older. So the parents might still have to incubate them. And uh, next up, what do nestlings eat? Um, Depends on the species again. Um, nestlings tend to need protein to go quickly, to grow quickly. Most pastorines feed nestlings on, on insects, particularly caterpillars, because those are easy to digest and they have a lot of the nutrients they need. Other birds may feed a mixture of insects, fish, and meat. A few species, such as doves and finches, might feed seeds to their young, but it's really rare. If you have a bird feeder um, out in your yard in summer, your birds aren't going to be using it to feed their young. They're going to be eating the insects that are in your yard if you have them. Um, so now I'm just going to go through the life of an altricial songbird. Um, pictures here, except for actually the top right one, uh, for the rest of this part of the talk will be all mine from my work with juncos. Um, so the first stage is from days one to three, like I talked about before, they're naked, they're blind, and they're silent. And they're totally dependent on their parents for food um, and to keep them, you know, comfortable and at a good temperature. They have four functions. They eat, they sleep, they beg barely, and they defecate. Um, many species produce fecal sacs, like you can see in this Critlin's warbler up in the top right. Um, basically, you know, bird poop smells, and you don't want to attract predators to the nest. So these uh, nestlings will lay, will defecate these sort of um, contained sacs, and when the parents see them, they'll just um, move them away a safe distance from the nest and then drop them there. That way, they keep the nest clean, they, uh, and they keep predators away from the site a little bit better. Towards the end of this period, you can sort of see in this bottom right corner, you can kind of see some down feathers starting to come in, but again, they're still kind of tiny and helpless at this stage. Next up is, you know, sort of the second stage, they're partially feathered. This is when sort of some of their earliest body feathers start coming in. Um, this is generally for juncos, again, it's from Days four to eight, um, down feathers continue to develop, and pin feathers. So those those um, pin feathers you can kind of see on this picture on the bottom begin to form, and you can kind of see how you've got this metallic looking sheath, and from that sheath, the actual feather itself will sort of break open. Um, sometime during this period, that their eyes will open and they'll begin vocalizing. Um, generally, you see high. Uh, at this stage, they're high pitched and they're quiet. Uh, and it tends to be like sort of a peeping noise. And sort of towards the end of the stage, they start to gain a little bit of mobility, like they'll hop and then they'll fall asleep if you handle them. Um, next step is when they're partially feathered, um, days nine to 13. The flight feathers are mostly developed. Um, so they've broken from their sheaths and they're sort of part of the way there. They're almost fully feathered. They're very loud. And they've got this um, harsh begging and super consistent. Predator approaches the nest. At this stage, they are able to leave the nest. So if they see like a, a crow or something or their parents signal to them, hey, we've been found, scram, they can actually leave and sort of like hop or waddle away. And that way they have a higher chance of survival. Um, sometimes, and sometimes during this period, the nestlings will fledge and become fledglings. Um, a young fledgling tends to hide in um, hide in vegetation, it'll be loud, um, loudly begging, and that's how the parents will find them. And it's still reliant, but at this stage, it's learning to fly and it's learning to forage for itself. 
generally doesn't have a tail because the tail develops later, but it'll start to grow in as the chick ages. We'll often show this yellow gait, which is used, uh, you know, it's almost like an innate response by parents to feed the nest when they see sort of that yellow gait there. The, this is a stage when, when uh, humans will often bring in these fl young fledglings, say like, hey, this baby bird was on my porch, I'm bringing it in. And actually, well, that bird, you know, that bird was, had left the nest already, it was perfectly safe. So one thing to note is that, you know, if you see a mostly feathered bird like this, it's perfectly, you know, it's perfectly, uh, you know, it's supposed to be out of the nest. And then finally get to the oldest um, stage, which is, um, you know, when they become juvenile. So like, you know, probably around day 26 on, the tail's fully formed, you've got this nice juvenile plumage. At this point, they can fly, they're self-sufficient, the parents may evict them from the territory. Um, and at this point, they're just gonna sort of go out on their own. Why do nestings leave the nest before they can fly if that makes them vulnerable? And the reason for that is that nests aren't actually that safe. We tend to think of nests being safe, but they aren't. Parents make hundreds of trips to the nest each day in order to feed nestlings. And each trip, they are adapted to, you know, avoid predators when they make these trips. However, it just takes one mix up, mix up to, you know, lead a predator to a nest and have your uh, nest created. Um, so the less time they spend in the nest, the safer it is. Nestings are loud, especially when they're older. So when you've got like three or four nestings in a nest together, that tends to, you know, that tends to draw in predators. So for predators, it's best, for parents it's best, if all the nestings sort of are not in one basket. If you've got one nestling hiding out here and another nestling hiding out 100 meters away, you know, you can still feed them, but if a predator finds one, it doesn't mean they're gonna, they're gonna attack the other. So it's, uh, again, it's not keeping all your nestings in one basket. What are some threats to nests? You know, predators like snakes, birds, cats, rodents, things like that, root parasites like um, cowbirds, ectoparasites or endoparasites, um, like blowflies, botflies, some hippoboscids, I think, mites. You can see this uh, hummingbird at the top left was evicted from a nest because they had been infested with mites and we had to bring it to a rehabber. Um, so parasites can also play a major role. And weather disturbance. Um, so whether it's something like a wind knocking over a nest or it's a, um, so, um, it's like the tide, you know, brush, you know, tide rising and swamping like a marsh nest, um, that can also affect things as well. Or humans, for instance, may disturb nests, large mammals might disturb ground nests, et cetera. Um, so why study nesting and breeding biology? This is the last part, I swear. I didn't realize I would go so over. It's a great way to study and test ecological principles. So nest is an intensely complicated procedure. It involves interactions between intraspecific competitors for territories for mates, between interspecific competitors for territories for breeding sites, Involves interactions between predators and prey, um, you know, whether or not the bird itself has to avoid predators or has to find prey to bring back to the nest. Involves interactions between parasites and hosts. Um, involves um, parent and offspring interactions and interactions between you know the the birds themselves and their abiotic environments. And so it's a really rich system. They're really rich systems to understand how these interactions affect, you know life. Um, why study it from an evolutionary perspective? Again, as we talked about, it's super critical for, bir for um, birds to survive is successfully reproducing. Um, so it's under heavy selective pressure. And so we can ask these really interesting questions about how species change their breeding behavior in response to past changes. We can also ask how will species change their breeding behavior in response to future changes. You know, how do you get from a bird like a junco that mostly nests on the ground to one like here that's nesting in a fuse box in an underground parking garage three stories underground? Now, how does that happen? Is it through evolution? Is it through plasticity? Through some other process? It's a really interesting field. And finally, um, why study nesting in green biology from a conservation perspective? Um, Many extinct species went extinct in part due to maladaptive breeding behaviors. Passenger pigeons, for, for example, 
um, adopted it. Basically, they nested uh, by the millions together. And the way they avoided predators was that basically there were too many of them and they couldn't get eaten. All, not all of them could eat. And no, um, they had no, um, they basically had no anti predator defenses except that there were so many of them. But then when they declined in population, this behavior became maladaptive because now you don't have the power of numbers to protect yourself. And so that's one of the reasons they went extinct. Um, the great auk, um, the first bird in North America to, America to become extinct, I believe. Um, maybe the second, actually. Um, but that one was a, a flightless colonial nester um, that nested in large groups and weren't scared of people. And so when they were on their breeding grounds, they were sort of helpless. And that really uh, negatively affected them as well. Uh, affected them as well because their eggs were harvested, their nestings were harvested, they were harvested on their breeding grounds because they were so easy to, to, um, to exploit. And finally, ivory-billed woodpeckers, the largest woodpecker in North America, went extinct because of um, basically, um, part of the reason it went extinct was because they had these super specific habitat requirements. They required specific gigantic trees in order to build their massive nests. And when those trees were logged, you know, they lost their ability to, to reproduce, to have their, to, to breed. Um, as, but it's not just useful to look at extinct species. We can also look at current endangered species. Um, you know, many species are so threatened with extinction that we are actually, we've undergone captive breeding programs you know, with condors, or we're, under, we're starting captive breeding programs, like with the Hawaiian honey creepers, like the Aki above. Um, and if we want to do these captive breeding programs, we really need to understand nesting behavior because we need to understand what do they eat? How long do they spend in the nest? How do we avoid imprinting? How do we avoid them uh, associating with humans? How do we teach them the proper fear of humans? How do we reintroduce them back in the wild? How do, you know, how do we simulate fledging for them? What behaviors are taught versus what are innate? Because they're all super important questions that, um, that um, captive breeders need to understand if they want to be successful. It's also, you know, even not for captive breeding, but it's important for um, uh, monitoring threatened species in the wild. For instance, Western snowy plovers, they nest on sandy beaches. And these are areas that tend to be heavily trafficked by humans. They tend to be highly um, disturbed by dogs. And, you know, there tends to be a lot of introduced predators. So questions arise, like how can we manage beaches for both people and threatened birds? And when should access be restricted? How much room need and how much room needs to be set aside? Um, another example is the least bells vireo. It built uh, in southern southwestern California. It's uh, an endangered species. Uh, it uh, builds cup nests in riparian mule flat willow habitats. So it's got these super specific habitat requirements, and its habitat has been greatly reduced due to development. In addition, cowbirds have colonized due to human development. And these, this subspecies is not adapted super well to cowbird parasitism. So we need to understand how can we effectively control cowbird parasitism so we don't um, cause further declines, and how much riparian habitat needs to be set aside to maintain, you know, vario pairs and vario populations. So what you can do, some ideas for what you can do, put up a nest box in your yard, or maintain natural cavities if you have them on your property. Avoid tree trimming um, and clearing vegetation during the breeding season whether it's things like trees or even ivy or um, shrubs, you know, birds can nest in all those locations. If you find a young bird, determine if it's a young nestling, you know, if it looks like helpless, its eyes are and everything, or if it's a fledgling before handling it. Um, because again, um, a lot of the time when people bring in nestlings to bring in young birds to, to um, rehabilitators, they're actually bringing in perfectly healthy and happy fledglings. My rule of thumb is that you, if you have to chase after it, you probably don't need to catch it. If, um, if you find a nest, consider monitor, learning to monitor and monitoring it and submitting data to nestwatch.org, which is a citizen science project run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. A huge benefit would be to keep cats indoors during the nesting season. Cats are huge um, predators of nestlings and fledglings. Um, and if you want to learn more, Nestwatch also has an insane amount of information about nesting biology for a variety of different species. Okay, I went way over. That's it. Um, but maybe like five to ten minutes for questions. Sam, would you like me to read you the questions? Yes, that would be awesome. Hopefully okay. 
from Laura. Would relatives be more willing to take care of another pair's young because it carries some of its genes as opposed to birds that are more distantly related? This Absolutely. is talking about the, the group yeah. nest. Absolutely. Uh, in most species where you see cooperative nesting, you do tend to see um, relatives helping each other out. So young birds helping out their parents, um, for instance. Um, there are exceptions. And what you talked about there was, is called kin selection, which is a super interesting concept in evolution. Um, there are exceptions um, where some species actually benefit more by helping unrelated pairs. Um, and it's, it's weird to think about, but it makes sense if you remember that oftentimes these individuals will be raising daughters. And if you, know, if you have a random, well, you know, if, if you're helping out an unrelated parent, some of those also will likely be daughters and you might be able to mate with one of those daughters afterward. And since you're unrelated, it's okay. And so maybe you're producing, you're helping raise your own mate. So there are exceptions to that rule, but generally speaking, it does tend to be relatives helping each other out. Okay, next question also from Laura. Are there any examples of birds that have a breeding strategy that changes depending on resource availability? Good question. Yes, there. Um, like a, yeah, definitely. Um, birds have to, you know, birds try and optimize, you know, their breeding strategy in order to make do with the situations at hand. So like I talked about before, birds may decide to abandon nesting attempt, you know, like not nest if conditions are poor. Um, they can also change the um, location, you know, they can change, um, sorry, the number of eggs they build. So if it's like a great year for caterpillars, for instance, you might see birds laying an extra egg because they're able to do so. Whereas if they're laying, if they might try and stick with what they can reasonably hope to um, raise. Um, one thing I found in my research is that many birds um, undergo what's called uh, informed, my juncos at least undergo informed renesting. So they can actually change where they nest if you know, they had a prior, prior failure. So my juncos, if they succeed, they have like a 70 something percent chance of using the same sort of substrate again. Whereas if they failed in that, in that sort of substrate, they only have a 40% likelihood of using that same substrate. So yeah, they can definitely um, change where they nest. They can basically, individuals can learn, uh, you know, where to nest, when to nest, um, how to conceal nest. Um, this is all information that they can gather um, from experience. So yeah, great question. Okay, from Emma, any idea if there is an advantage to allotricial hatchlings over precocial ones? To me, it seems like precocial has a much higher chance of having a hatchling survive. So it would be unlikely that allotricial birds would exist unless there's some sort of evolutionary advantage. Great question. I don't have like a, a an, a perfect, I don't have like a, a slam dunk answer for you, but I, there are um, certain benefits. For instance, um, a lot of these birds, you know, these birds that tend to raise altricial young tend to be super small. And because they're super small, their eggs, you know, the, the um, in order to effectively fly, they can't really hold a lot of weight. So, they might need to lay eggs that are less developed, for instance, than, um, than you know, say like a larger bird, like a duck might be able to, to hold. So if you think like a hummingbird, a hummingbird is absolutely tiny. And for a hummingbird to, to lay like a precocial egg, even though um, young are much small, you know, like precocial young are still much smaller than their parents. They are still larger and they, they sit in the, they, they'll probably sit and develop longer in the, you know, in the in the um, ovaries than um, than you know altricial eggs do. Altricials are probably faster to develop. Um, so basically, you're trading you know, hold the, you know you're trading incubation time and time actually spent in the female's body for more time um, actually raising the young. <coughs> I can't swear that's the answer, but I'm pretty sure that has a, that that's a really major role in it. Okay, um, from Nick, 
is there any distinction between seasonal monogamy exhibited by ducks, which have frequent extra pair copulations and lack male presence during and after incubation versus polygyny? Or are they generally grouped together, as you said in your polygyny slide? I would say that, um, um, So serial monogamy tends to be a sort of, a lot of these concepts are sort of not super well defined. So serial monogamy probably can mean different things like, um, um, it could mean what we're talking about with ducks. I tend to refer to ducks as, you know, more, a bit more polygynous, but you could also, I guess, consider serial mon monogamy. These terms are, are a lot, Different. The way I, it's, in other words, it's a little bit, I don't quite understand all the ramifications of all the terms myself. What I would say is that with ducks, um, with ducks, with monogamy, I tend to assume some level of parental care. Um, males are doing at least some help with raising young. And by, and by doing that, they sort of close themselves off hypothetically to, um, raising other young. Now they can still engage in extra pair copulations, but they're gonna do that on the sly. It's basically cheating, right? They are going to mate with other females, but they're not gonna be involved in raising those young, while they mm -hmm. will be involved in raising their main clutch. Whereas with something like um, ducks, males will mate with multiple females. However, um, it's not like there's like a, a main nest and then sort of extra pair copulations because he hasn't really formed any long-term pair bonds at all. Does that sort of make sense? I may have... It does to me. I, <laughs> I hope it does to Nick. Hopefully that makes sense. How about like one okay. more question and then we can... About one more? Okay. Um, Laura's already had a couple, so I'm going to skip hers. Sorry, Laura. And I'll, I can answer questions at the end as well. I okay. Can extra. Um, from Teresa, maybe I misheard but in your sexual dimorphism section, did you mention that birds, males, can actually deliberately work on their appearance, color, plumage, et cetera? It's not purely genetic, question mark. Correct, absolutely. So a lot of plumage is, you know, not genetically based. Um, if you are, a lot of pigmentation, for instance, birds get their color, a lot of their colors, especially their reds and their yellows and their oranges, from pigments called carotenoids. Uh, and some others called xantho, I, I forget the term, but the most well-known one is, uh, is the car carotenoids, which you find in things like carrots. Mm -hmm. And these carotenoids are super helpful um, for birds. They, you know, they're important nutrients. Um, and so if you can, if you have a lot of carotenoids, you can show that by essentially displaying these pigments into your plumage. And um, you can incorporate that into your feathers. If you do that, you're essentially saying, hey, I have a great diet. I've been eating a lot. I have great access. You know, my territory has great access to, to great food. Um, you'll be able to find a lot of food here to raise young um, and so forth. Um, that's not genetically based at all. Um, that is based on what they've been eating. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one more or not? One. Let's do one more, and then I, I'll do my best to get back to all the others at the end. Okay. From Mike N. Where do crows build their nests? Is it true they build nest villages? That is, many nests built near each other. Um. Great question. I am actually not, not an expert on um, uh, crow nesting behavior other than a little bit of passive experience. Um, crows tend to build platform nests. They tend to be these large, uh, they tend to be these large um, corvids that tend to build these large platform nests. They can also nest on buildings um, and other artificial structures and sometimes on outcrops. 
Um, in terms of raising villages, my hunch, my, I think the answer to that is no. I'm pretty sure they maintain like pretty large territories, like pretty significantly sized territories. But I can't swear, and maybe crows in different areas do different things. Um, but the crow nests I've come across have tended, you know, the have been is, you know, isolated, solitary nests, as opposed to being in sort of sort of grouping. And the papers I think I've read about crow nests have been tended, you know, emphasized territories. So I think the answer, to my knowledge, is no. But you might want to look up at something like all about, you know, all about birds or nest watch to mm -hmm. check that out for certain. Okay, shall we have everyone else save their questions to the end? Yeah, sorry about that. I didn't realize the talk would be <clears> so long. If, um, can I just note that some of the questions are answered by other students if you read down to the end of the chats. So um, anyway, thank you for your questions. You know way more than I do. I've been trying to answer some of the questions myself as well. Okay. Awesome, Bettina. Sounds like you've got your sound system to work. Uh, that wasn't my sound issue, but it's too late now, so we'll just um, move forward and hope it works. Okay, awesome. So I stopped screen sharing. Are you a co-host? Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm still a co-host or not. I know that Peter had problems with being a co-host, and so I couldn't add him as a co-host. Try now. Try see if you can become a co-host right now. There we go, perfect. Okay, so everybody can hear me, I hope? Yes, very good sound. Oh. Okay, great. Well, I wanted to um, add a couple quick things to what Sam just mentioned about nesting and um, what things that we can do um, to help these birds, especially ground nesters. Um, some of you may not even realize that uh, among all those grassland birds that nest on the ground, we actually have a raptor, the northern harrier, which also nests on the ground. So one thing as a conservationist and uh, someone that's been doing bird research for many years, I would ask that um, you please stay on the trails. And no matter what good intentions you may have or otherwise um, reasons why you feel the need to hike off trail, please don't do that. Um, not only might you trample eggs, um, but you might also be attracting predators by your human scent that would follow your scent to a nest. Um, keep your dog on a leash. The dog off leash uh, may run into that nest on the ground. And if you have often seen, as I have a dog come running back to its owner while it's chewing, <laughs> You don't know what it might have found out there, and it might have been a nestling. So I um, have written some other notes, but I'll let them go since there's little time. But uh, I wanted to talk to you about some shorebirds and flycatchers. And I'm hoping that um, you will be able to see my screen. So our list that I've written here for these shorebirds uh, and flycatchers is a little bit Western skewed. So there are a couple birds that apply to us here in the West that don't, um, that aren't on the national study birds that you folks will have to know. Um, they are skewed for those uh, in the West, but I think there's only two of them. So as you can see from this picture, there's many, many different types of shorebirds and um, we have different ones that appear here in the West that are not um, all across the country. But this is um, one of the nests or one of the that uh, Sam mentioned, the killdeer. And as you can see from this range map, which I hope is clear to you on your screen, they are um, one of the most abundant birds in uh, North America as far as shorebirds go. Um, they do build a scrape nest on the ground and sometimes they decorate it with shells or other bits of rocks and sticks and other times it's just simply a nest um, scraped out with their breast as Sam had mentioned. 
I have sounds to play for you because this is one of the sounds that you're expected to know. And I'm hoping that these sounds will play. That's the test I wanted to do before you all joined the meeting, but I worked it earlier, so. So that's one of the traditional killdeer calls, and this is their song. I'm not sure people were able to, to hear that. Okay, I'm hearing it in my computer. I hoped if you could hear my voice, you could oh. hear this. No, I'm hearing, actually, I can hear it. Play one more time. Sorry, I was, okay. it's quiet. Well, it starts off slow, but it comes in, so. So basically the killdeer says its name. So that should be one for you uh, that's easy to remember. Um, they ha inhabit um, areas that are open. Um, they, they even nest in gravel lots or parking lots or airport runways. As I mentioned, they're quite abundant. Um, they can be found near or away from water and then that's probably why they're successful all across uh, the country. They eat small invertebrates, uh, even snails and crawfish and, and grasshoppers and wonderful things like that. Um, this is, oh I'm sorry, now it's, I tried to advance the slide and now it wants to play the recording again. Here we go. This is the killdeer, and one of its uh, identifying um, characteristics is that it has two um, dark bands around. We have one complete band or um, a partial uh, ring around its neck. Um, this is how easily camouflaged they are. Here's a killdeer here. I'm not sure if you're seeing on here. Here's a killdeer here. There's one here. And actually there might be one here. This whole uh, little um, wood chip area was loaded with killdeers when I took this photo. But here is the killdeer on a scrape nest. And basically this is just gravel in the road. And here is that broken wing display that Sam mentioned that was trying to distract me away from the nest. And I took these pictures only as I walked quickly by. I snapped my camera a couple of times and kept moving. Um, it was part of my study. This is one of my study species for the phenology study that Sam mentioned. And so I wanted to get these photos so that I could help educate folks like yourself and our participants in the study. And this is another uh, female, perhaps a male sitting on a nest. And I wonder if you can see that there are actually a day old nestling here. And oh, this might look shadowed, but there's a couple of eggs right here. And let me see if I can show you in this picture. I've marked them. Can you see them marked? It's difficult to see. That shows you how important it is that we stay on the trail. <laughs> and this will um, reiterate that. Look how well those eggs blend in with that gravel. And from a distance, you can barely see those eggs. So the, I put the killer before American Golden Plover, but in the AO. Uh, S order of things, the American Ornithological Society, um, the American Golden Clover comes first, but I had those photos of the scrape nest, and this is a very similar um, situation with the American Golden Clover. They also would build a scrape nest on the ground. Uh, it's lined with lichens or dry grasses. They have three to five eggs, and those incubation period is 24 to 27 days. Um, 
these next three plovers that we'll talk about uh, have similar breeding strategies. They're from the family, and I'll, I'll probably hack this, but <laughs> Jared, I, I never had to learn my scientific bird names when I've been birding all these 30 years until I went to schools to get my biology degree. So I'm, I'm not good at pronouncing these scientific names either. Charadridae, but maybe Sam will be able to help us with that uh, later. So those are lapwings and plovers. As you can see, they breed in the far, far um, uh, Arctic tundra, and that makes them very vulnerable um, uh, to loss, you know, with climate change, we're losing habitat as that area heats up. And when the birds are already breeding in the coldest regions of uh, North America and beyond, there's really nowhere left for them to go as climate increases. So um, those species that breed in these Arctic tundras are our most vulnerable um, perhaps if they can't adapt to the warmer climate. One of the breeding characteristics what we call alternate plumage for the American golden plover is this big white headband and white patch around the neck um, and they get a complete black belly. We also have the Pacific golden plover which their back has a little bit more goldeny feathers um, so there's a, somewhat of a look-alike to this bird. The basic plumage in the wintertime outside the breeding season is quite drab, and this is what often we will see in migration. Um, uh, if we're not up in the Alaska, uh, Alaskan tundra or, or high Canada, um, we will see a bird looking like this. The snowy plover is, um, actually this map is a little bit misleading because the western snowy plover, which is the purple zones there on your map, are the coastal subspecies that occur here in Southern California, and they are heavily threatened due to many of the things that Sam mentioned. Vehicles on the beach, illegal dogs on the beach, whether legal or illegal actually, um, uh, you know, human use of the beach, um, they build a scrape nest directly on the sand. And as you can imagine, with all the beach goers and all the beach activities, that's kind of like a, a mismatch for available habitat areas. The western snowy plover is here um, all year, although its breeding grounds are different than its roosting areas in the wintertime but we see them all year round in different locations. And the ones in the central uh, North America there are a different subspecies and they may be faring a little bit better than our Southern California uh, Western species. So that's a species that truly is on the list for the SoCal folks, um, but uh, it's important to, as a conservationist for you guys to understand that it's that we help to preserve these kinds of things. One of the other issues that they face is when we clean up the rack line. They eat invertebrates out of the, the kelp, and so if there is no kelp, then um, there's no food, and eventually the more frequently that kelp is being removed, then um, the availability of food will die off and actually won't come back. So uh, even if the kelp is allowed to stay, oftentimes it won't be re-inhabited by those insects that are using it. So this is um, an example of a plover that has um, no complete band around its neck. So that's how um, you might tell this snowy plover from the other two species we've already mentioned. And of course, this bill is a little longer and a little more dainty than the others. And here is one um, very well camouflaged. They tend to hang out in these divots in the sand. And unfortunately for them, um, they don't really spook like other birds off the ground. If, if they're threatened, they actually hunker down and kind of wait it out and hope they're not seen by a predator. And one of the places they like to 
um, frequent is the track marks of the vehicles that have driven on the beach. So say a lifeguard or a maintenance person was riding um, a, a vehicle on the beach and left tracks. Well, it's uh, kind of like a windbreak for snowy plovers. So they may be sitting right in those vehicle tracks and the next vehicle that comes, if it's going too fast, this bird will hunker down rather than fly away and get run over. So it's um, it's kind of a tragedy um, of that particular uh, adaptation to avoid predation. Uh, the American oyster catcher is a very interesting bird we have on the east and um, through the Gulf of Mexico, the catcher that's the western version. Um, this bird is uh, has its name based on that wonderful bill that you see there. It actually uses that bill to pry open clams and mussels and pick uh, pry oysters and other uh, marine organisms, bivalves, uh, mollusks, and sometimes even um, limpets off of the off of the rocky coastline so that's where it gets that beautiful oyster catcher name um this one should be easy to identify it's got all what uh, all black head with white body and a brown back and that distinctive red skin around the eye the american abset now is um Recurvorosterae is the genus, and um, you can see that in my next slide with the bill shape. And these, although they look very similar, are sexually dimorphic, and I'll show you more about that in just a moment. But they're a little bit more Western uh, situated. They forage in shallow fresh waters. They use a side to side motion with their bills sweeping through the water, um, trying to catch small um, uh, invertebrates in the water and so on. And this is a pre courtship kind of a dance. This is the female on the left uh, and the male on the right. And if you notice, his bill is a little straighter than her bill. Her bill is a little more recurved or curved upwards, where the, which is where they get their name. And this actually um, changes with hormonal um, uptake, if you will, during the breeding season. So um, most often the rest of the year when they lose this rusty breeding color and their head turns gray, um, they also don't really have such a strong recurved bill and so you can often um uh, or you can't often i should say maybe uh, sex these birds in the off season it's usually during the breeding season that you can um, tell the males from the females and here's another picture that shows that beautifully side by side the next bird will be the black neck stilt and it's standing here next to this American avocet. This American avocet is um, obviously outside the breeding season where they've lost their beautiful rusty color and their head is gray. This is what we see in the wintertime. Although if um, you look at that bill, it's awfully recurved. So that might be a female. So perhaps she still has uh, enough hormones for that to occur. One of the ways that you can differentiate this American avocet from the black neck still is that the American Avocet has that white, um, that white line or wing bar, if you will, uh, through the black wing, whereas the American, or excuse me, the black neck stilt has just a plain black wing. Um, their leg color is different, as you can see. The American Avocet has um, bluish gray legs and the uh, black neck stilt has the pink legs and actually that pink gets deeper during the breeding season as well. I'm not sure when this picture was taken, but I suspect it was sometime in the winter. So the black neck stilt um, is uh, also a, a, a westerly um, or centrally located species, although there's a separate subspecies in Hawaii, but they will also 
um, occur all the way down into Central and South America. Um, they in also inhabit shallow marshlands uh, or wetlands with limited vegetation, including um, salt ponds and uh, flooded areas near rivers and, and shallow lagoons. Um, they eat uh, invertebrates in the water column, uh, mosquito larvae, soldier flies, brine flies, crickets, grasshoppers, they'll, they'll eat insects that they can catch um, on the water's edge as well. And here's a, an example of that all black wing that makes it much easier to differentiate even uh, at a distance between the black necked stilt and the American avocet. And here's just a cute chick that I encountered um, that was actually about to get eaten by a raccoon and this was all wet and running down the trail away from the threat. Um, the Dunlin is uh, a, a bird that we see in the non-breeding season um, here in Southern California and all along the coast. They too breed very high up along, if you can see on the range map there, the edges of Alaska, oops, sorry, the edges of Alaska and Nova Scotia and so on. And so um, again, uh, I haven't really mentioned the, the boxes here above my range maps, but if you've noticed, they are mostly species of least concern, but they also have a, a, a red arrow suggesting that their numbers are decreasing. And depending on the species, there's many reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons for the Dunlin, um, they uh, suspect that it has to do with um, the, the, well, actually they didn't mention what the decline is. My suspicion is that it's climate change. Um, they, they did mention in the literature that 30% have uh, decreased since 20, 2006, so that's not all that long ago. Um, so uh, that's something that we need to think about when thinking about climate change. Um, here is the alternate plumage. So this is the plumage that they get for the breeding season with the big uh, black belly and the beautiful uh, tawny and black um, feathering on the back. And this is what they look like in the basic plumage or the winter plumage that we down here in North America will likely see. Um, we may see remnants of the breeding plumage by the time they get here, but most often um, we see this basic plumage and that's the uh, way we would need to be able to identify them. And then I saw this and I just thought this was the cutest picture ever. So, so I had to throw that in for you. And look how amazing that camouflage is with that tundra that that bird is blending into. The ruddy turnstone, um, again, is one of those species that breeds very high up in um, the uh, uh, tundra in the Arctic zone. And so again, another bird that we should be really concerned about um, uh, understanding and, and, and making sure we're working on our conservation issues for a bird like this. They underco um, uncover prey much like the oyster catcher. They call it a turnstone because they use that specialized bill to flip over um, pebbles or rocks or shells or seaweed to get at the insects and um, spiders and beetles and things that are underneath. Um, here's a photo during the breeding season and it looks like it's got a bee in its bill. And here's the basic plumage, the one that we would see uh, in the winter time. Um, we do get some not complete um, alternate plumage, but we see them kind of transitioning to their alternate plumage, either on their way back to us in the winter time or on their way um, up to their breeding grounds. And here's another photo. There is a little bit of sexual dimorphism in this bird. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the time to pull the 
photos to show you, but that might be something you do in your own research for these um, Olympiad uh, tests that you'll be taking. The spotted sandpiper is one of the birds that um, Sam also mentioned. It's uh, in his uh, breeding uh, information. It also builds a, a scrape nest and it is also considered quite abundant in North America, but it, it's one of the things that we um, often need to be concerned about as far as um, pesticide use, because these birds will nest um, in many different types of habitats and ranges and where the water is pooling and so on. And so where there's pesticide use, these birds can um, be affected by that because they're eating aquatic larvae and so on. And this is a characteristic flight for the spotted sandpiper. They fly very low over the water's edge. And so they may um, be identified because uh, when they're flying from one side of a pond to another, uh, perhaps they'll be flying just a few feet over the water surface and they have a very distinctive wing beat that um, can be easily recognized. Here is one that's actually stabbing at uh, flies in the air, so it will grab its insects from the air or perhaps um, probe its bill into the sand or the mudflat here. Um, or they might run after something like, I watched this um, spotted sandpiper with a huge look of surprise and suddenly run over and grab this huge grub by the edge of a, a actually a man-made lake at a park. It was very cute to see him get so excited and run over there and catch that grub. Um, the Wilson snipe is a bird that has been hunted um, and actually they introduce them to locations for hunting. Um, they are another one that we should be concerned about as far as pesticide use and so on because they will eat crickets and grasshoppers and things that could um, uh, accumulate pesticides for them. Um, they uh, were split off of the common snipe which is the European species but they are all over wet, marshy, boggy type areas and um, they eat lizards or frogs or fish or whatever they can, um, if they can actually um, include it in their diet and, and manipulate it with that bill. This is what they look like. They have striped heads that are pretty rounded with this big, long, oops, sharp bill. And they're kind of a pudgy little short-legged bird. This is another photo of um, one standing by the water's edge. And I have this arrow pointing to the stripe on its head because I put it right next to a very similar species. This is one more uh, Wilson snipe with the stripes down its back and the barring on the edges of its body. But it's very similar uh, perhaps to the American woodcock and the American woodcock is now a bird of the east and um, they again are someone that uh, we need to be concerned about because they are foraging by probing into the soil. That long bill is flexible and they don't even have to remove the bill from the ground always to capture something. They can just kind of probe it down in there because it's flexible and take um, uh, their food out of the ground. But one of the other concerns with the American woodcock is that they eat a lot of earthworms and invertebrates that spend a lot of their time in the soil. And so heavy metals like lead and um, uh, other uh, I'm trying to think of the name and I, it escapes me. Um, I know I'm pressed for time now. We've got 15 more minutes and I still haven't got the flycatcher, so forgive me for being a little nervous here. Um, cadmium, is, cadmium is what I was looking for and other heavy metals in the earthworms um, and in the soil 
um, are certainly make these birds vulnerable to uh, poisoning and, and dying. And here's this beautiful woodcock. Um, its head's a little more kind of V-shaped. It's not quite as round as the uh, snipe. And it has uh, horizontal stripes uh, going across the top of its head and a mostly gray nape and uh, sides of its neck. Here's another example that shows how well it blends in, first of all, but also those stripes that are going in the opposite direction of that of the common snipe. So, flycatchers. Um, flycatchers are uh, these particular flycatchers. Um, I guess I should have mentioned that all those shorebirds are from the order uh, Teratiformes. And these will be Passeriformes, the flycatchers. Um, the particular family is uh, Tyranidae, which is the um, tyrant flycatchers. And we have many different types of flycatchers, um, you know, across North America. Um, the Black Phoebe is um, the Western version. So this is for the folks here in the, in the West and that as part of their list, um, the sounds are important. So I'm gonna play quickly the call and the song of the Black Phoebe. So that's the call of the Black Phoebe. And here's the song. Uh oh, it's gonna start over. It won't let me pause it. So I hope you can hear that. Basically, the black Phoebe is saying its name. Phoebe? 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 So the black Phoebe eats insects. Um, often it, this should be a short recording, but I can't stop it. No, no, no. Okay. Um, here, I'll just move on. <laughs> um, this is what the black baby looks like. Um, some people say it looks like it's wearing a little black tuxedo. Uh, it flies from a perch and catches an insect in flight, or it may fly down to the ground and catch an insect off the ground, or it may hover over a pond and, and kind of glean something off the surface of the pond or just under the surface of the water. This is um, a young fledg fledgling black phoebe, and you can notice that the tail is quite short. And if you can see on the wing bars, there's a little bit of a buffy hue to the wing bars, and that can help you identify that as a fledgling, a recently fledged bird. Um, of course, the tail is a giveaway, but that rufousy color in the wing bars will last about two weeks. And so you should be able to see the recently fledged birds versus the adults in the field. This is a, a bird that's just about to fledge the nest. And here's one of those beautiful um, mud nests that uh, Sam was talking about. The Black Phoebe built a mud nest using some grasses and some fresh mud and some twigs and things. And it will um, harden this way and hopefully uh, successfully last the entire season. Um, they will clutch, I think, maybe uh, one to five times, depending on um, food availability and so on, disturbances and things, I suppose. But I know oftentimes, too, with the cliff swallows or other mud nest builders, sometimes, unfortunately, the mud will dry and the birds, uh, the nest will fall or partially break off and then they have to repair them during the season. So the Eastern Kingbird, 
uh, is obviously doesn't come uh, west of the Rockies. It's um, very abundant during the breeding season and migrates to Central and South America uh, in the winter time. It also catches insects midair and, and uh, will eat um, other types of things um, in migration, some locusts and bugs and flies. Some of these birds, some of these fly catchers will also eat berries depending on um, food availability. These birds, these fly catchers are all altricial nesters. And so most every single one I've mentioned so far and the ones I will mention um, are going to hatch uh, with their eyes closed and either have skin or just a teeny bit of down. And so they're heavily dependent on their parents' um, ability to bring them food and uh, keep them alive and keep them hidden from predators. Um, the, the, the shorebirds I mentioned are primarily, well, they are precocial birds. They have, um, uh, they are usually within an hour or two or a day, depending on the species, uh, able to run away or leave the nest. In fact, in case of the killdeer, they don't come back to the nest. And most of these birds, once they've left the nest scrape, that's it, they're uh, on their own, they're foraging on their own, they're relying for their parents to help protect them from predators, but they're feeding themselves. So they're only partially um, dependent on their parents in a sense, whereas these altricial birds are completely dependent on their parents and their uh, parents' ability to bring them food and to um, sustain them uh, the time that they need to, to leave the nest. And, um, if you see here on my slide, the incubation period is 14 to 17 days, but the nesting um, period after that to, to get them from the hatch to fledge is about 16 to 17 days. Here's a beautiful picture of an Eastern Kingbird. And um, then and we have the Eastern Hi. Phoebe, which is just like, um, the, it's the eastern version of the black phoebe that we have here in the west. Um, they may have one to two clutches and uh, two to six eggs per clutch. Uh, they too eat bees and beetles and wasps and flying dragonflies and so on. Um, very, very similar lifestyle to the, the black phoebe. Um, they are just occurring um, on the eastern half of North America. And this is what they look like, very similar to the Black Phoebe, but the Black Phoebe, as you remember, had the black um, bib going all the way down. This is actually a little bit more of a yellow green than a white belly like the Black Phoebe has, and they're a little more grayish uh, on their upper parts. Maybe their tail's a little bit shorter, uh, but they're very uh, similar, um, but not quite as dark as the Black Phoebe. And they too say, Phoebe um, in their name. They don't have the upslur and the downslur, they just have the upslur. So their vocalization is a little bit different than um, that of the black Phoebe, but very similar. The great crested flycatcher is part of a family called Myarchus, and the Myarchus flycatchers are very similar. There's, oh, I don't remember, maybe eight eight or so Myarchus flycatchers that we have here. And down in Mexico, there's about 20 species. Um, some of ours do migrate through Central uh, America and, and northward. Um, I've seen some of ours down there in Costa Rica. Um, they uh, too eat insects and other fruits and berries. Um, they prefer breeding in territories that are open with um, broad-leafed mixed woodlands rather than just um, a forested area. Some of the other flycatchers have bigger eyes and they like to forage in the understory a little bit more than some of these bigger flycatchers which like open space where they can see um, well and can go after bigger insects. Oh, you know what? This is one that they need to know.
Okay, and this is what they look like. So one of the ways that you tell um, a Myarchus flycatcher, they're very upright, which flycatchers actually are compared to other songbirds, but these Myarchus stand very upright. And one of the characteristics is this under tail, which I'm not showing you my cursor, but this under tail coloring is important for helping you differentiate between the Myarchus flycatchers. Um, the belly color is going to be important. They all have these similar basic colors, but the degree at which they have yellow um, varies. And so that's one way to help identify them. The large or lack thereof size of bill is another way to help you uh, separate these. But the one you guys will be studying is this one. Um, depending on the time of year, if they've just come and um, hatched out or just had a fresh molt after breeding, they will have a, a, a yellower belly than at other times of the year. So color isn't always perfect for identification, but it certainly will help you in making some determinations on how to identify these things. Um, the olive-sided flycatcher, this is a bird that unfortunately is nearly threatened. It is um, a, a species I'm very much concerned about. Um, they like to breed in the boreal forest. And as many of you ha may have heard, the boreal forests um, are increasing in temperature. They are um, being destroyed quickly. And so since the uh, 1970s, I'm sure you've all heard back in February, all the news reports that we've lost one third of our bird population in North America, that's three billion birds have gone already. And so the olive-sided flycatcher, 79% of the known populations have fallen since the 1970s. That's a huge amount. And so I hope that with your study of these wonderful birds and other creatures that you will become interested in finding ways to help understand more about these birds, understand more about how to protect these birds so that you and your kids won't grow up without birds because um, with the loss of insects and the loss of these birds and everything being so interconnected, this will affect you and your children, and actually our ability to provide food for ourselves and obviously these um, important creatures. So I'm hoping some of these things will um, be impressed upon you today to, to help make a change. This is um, the olive-sided flycatcher. It's very much like the Eastern Phoebe and the Black Phoebe. Um, it has a vest, we say. It has a vest where the belly color is open all the way from the throat all the way down. Oh, I'm showing you the wrong person. I'm over here showing myself. <laughs> so this vest is open mostly uh, on the olive-sided flycatcher from the white throat all the way down the belly. And so it's split on either side. It has um, a modeling, if you will, to this breast color, whereas there are similar species um, that have a vested look, but they look more uniform in color. They don't look so modely. Um, primary projection is something you'll want to learn about flycatchers. That's where the folded wing, um, the, the primary tips of the wing come beyond the secondary feathers of the uh, flight feathers. And this is something you can look in the front of your field guide or look at a diagram of uh, description on how to, to uh, look at a bird but primary projection on these birds are important because some vary with their primary projection. And even if they look very similar, that primary projection also helps them, uh, helps you to distinguish amongst them. So that's something you should know about. Um, I think I just have two more to go here. Scissor-tailed flycatcher is a beautiful long-tailed bird. I can't wait to show you. They inhabit uh, mostly the central um, southern uh, portion of the United States. Their numbers too are decreasing, I suspect in part um, because of crops uh, dusting and things like that with um, 
grasshoppers and those types of things are some of our insects that we're losing the most of most frequently and that has to do with um, overuse of pesticides so um, let me show you this fabulous picture of the scissor tail fly catcher this of course is in the breeding season when the male has this beautiful long i guess the female does too beautiful long tails um, this is a play among several so here's one in the air and a couple down below and here's a last picture of that beautiful scissor tail we've had a few show up here in southern california over the years i haven't seen one in many years but um, there was a year we had three of them here in southern california so they do uh, they do seem to be expanding their range to a certain extent and the vermilion flycatcher, one of everybody's favorites. This is a bird that's also expanding its range and seeming to um, come more towards the coast. Um, they basically breed in the American Southwest and um, they are beautiful. This is a male, they are sent. Um, they have more of a, a pinkish in their belly and then the, the like a yellowish uh, wash to their belly but are mostly pale. And here's another view of the vermilion fly catcher. And lastly, the Western Kingbird. This is one we put in for the SoCal folks. Um, their range is obviously skewed towards the West. Um, they breed here in um, parts of um, Central and Western United States, but they they winter down in central um, Mexico and, and central um, South America. Here's a beautiful picture of the Western Kingbird. We do also in the West have a, a bird that breeds here on the Cassin's Kingbird that's very similar lookalike. Um, and you guys will have to figure out how to tell them apart if you're interested. But here are some fantastic resources that you can trust with the accurate information for bird um, identification and natural history and all those wonderful things. Conservation is a really um, important thing, as I mentioned to all of us at CN Sage. And so um, you can go to Audubon, nationalaudubon.org um, and find out more information on how to help. Um, there's action alerts that you can take to help um, for advocating for birds. You can sign up. Uh, have your parents uh, okay for you to get emails that help um, when we have important issues on conservation um, that need to be addressed. And um, the Nature's Red List um, help, helps you to understand the threatened species and where they stand. Unfortunately, it's a little misleading because it's for the globe. And so if some species are doing better in other parts of the world or other um, areas, it may skew um, what you understand to be true in your area. But these are all wonderful resources that you can use um, to help you understand more about uh, these beautiful birds. And with that, I thank you for uh, joining me. Let me unshare my screen, which I have to do up here. Are you awesome? Great. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I learned a lot. Um, hopefully, everybody else had a you know learned a lot, and that this was worthwhile to you. Um, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I had to rush through. Um, no, 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 no worries. Um, yeah. So, if anybody wants to ask um, questions, you know, now's a if anybody is able to stick around a little bit longer, you know, both of us are more than happy to answer questions. And Sam, you answered a couple of them, so. Yeah. Uh, I can also, um, Anne, were there other prior questions? We did have quite a few we didn't get around to. Okay. I can, how uh, you ask some of those to me and I can answer or Bettina can answer. Okay, let me go back and 
find them. Ah, I thought this was a good, really good question. How do the young doves and finches get enough calcium for skeletal growth? Great question. Uh, I specifically calcium. I am not. I'm not entirely sure. Um, finches, I think, include a mix um, of insect material and, and seeds in their diet. They might get enough that way. Um, there might be some in seeds. I'm not entirely sure. Doves pretty much entirely feed seeds, and the way they do it is basically they <coughs> um, they eat the seeds, digest them, and then turn it into a sort of a liquid called crop milk, and mm -hmm. then regurgitate that back into the into, into the chicks. Um, and somehow, I guess um, I guess for doves, and I guess as well that provides the uh everything that they the nutrients that they need okay uh from sydney you may have already answered this but what exactly influences the number of eggs bird produce birds produce can you generally take the size of a bird and gauge how many eggs they can lay or does it depend heavily on the size of the eggs of that certain bird it really it really depends a lot on families i'd say um like for instance hummingbirds are you know the smallest birds um and you know they will produce two eggs per per clutch generally and the largest birds like albatrosses eagles um things like that will produce one to two as well um and in the middle, you might have things like ducks, which produce like, you know, can produce 12 to 13. Um, so it's, it's really, there's not, I don't really believe there's any sort of. I don't think you could make a general rule. Yeah. I think no. it has to do with resource availability and, and <laughs> you know, uh, competition and threats. There's a lot of factors that go into how many they will do and even whether they'll double clutch if there's time or resources. Yeah. So there's quite a lot of factors involved. And taxonomy is very important as well. Right. Yeah. And I think those were the major ones. Some of them the students answered for the other students. So, so one okay. question I just got was, does the rising tides pose a threat to the nests of shorebirds or somehow do they protect them from, from tides? I can answer for some birds, Bettina, I don't know if you want to answer this as well. Maybe no more well, it depends on the type of nest, I suppose, and the species, because um, some birds will, uh, you know, lay a, um, or make a floating nest, so that as the tide comes in, the nest will float up on the vegetation and um, allow it to remain safe from the tidal inflow. And so they, their nest will uh, move up and down with the tides. Other birds can't do that. like the salt marsh um, sparrow that you were talking about. And so they just build a bunch of different nests and, you know, are hoping that some of those eggs and nests will survive. Um, big fluxes in, in uh, water level and so on. So it, it really depends on the egg. As far as um, the, the shorebirds that I talked about, those scrape nests, um, you know, they build them hopefully in a safe place that won't um, have an increased tide but you know now that we have um increase in sea level rise they may have to um i haven't seen it in the field yet but they may have to also evolve to understand that the tides are increasing and so placing their nest closer to the the rack line may not be beneficial they may end up having some nests for a while be inundated um, because the tides higher than instinctually they might expect yeah, that's a huge issue with um, salt marsh sparrows as well. Um, I had that um, uh, most, you know, like snowy plovers, <clears throat> least turns, things like that, tend to um, build nests in sort of not the intertidal, but above the intertidal. Right. Nests in dry sand and nests down, you know, where there's regular tidal action. That still leaves them highly. Um, to, uh, vulnerable to things like 
you know, storms that might bring storm surges or even hurricanes. Um, like in the, in the east, you might have like issues with um, snowy plovers, maybe not snowy plovers, but definitely piping plovers you might have issues with those. And um, you might have hurricanes just totally wipe out um, entire, um, you know, seasons clutches because uh, they just swamped all the nests and the nests, nests were swept away. So that is a huge issue. Um, potential issue for those. Well, it looks like it's 220. Yeah. And our attendance is going down. So, um, yeah, I'm noticing people have to leave. Yeah. So, um, I'd love so, to do this again. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sam and Bettina, for the wonderful presentations. Um, that was that was real educational, and I I've learned quite a bit from the uh, from the presentations. Um, I I also want to take this opportunity to uh, thank Anne for moderating all of our questions, and I also want to thank all of you out there for spending your Friday afternoon with us. I hope you've learned something new today, and you'll be able to take some of this what you learned today to your next birding trip. So stay tuned for more workshops in the future, and I look forward to seeing all of you at a future tournament. Goodbye for now and stay safe. Thank you, Peter. Bye. Thank you, Peter. Everyone. Thank you. No, you're leaving us, Sam, right? Hmm? You're going to send us away. Yeah. Uh, unless anybody else has any like last minute questions. I don't think so. I think it went quite well. But I guess we could let the students ask. Yeah, we'll see um, what goes. <laughs>